Okay, thanks, uh, thanks for this, uh, Francis. I appreciate it, especially as the first speaker, create a safe space. It seems to be completely the opposite of the usual conference environment. <laughs> where you're coming to get evaluated and you're afraid of what people are going to uh, say about uh, what you're doing. Actually, I didn't prepare slides today, but yesterday afternoon and last night, uh, also talking with some people, I said, oh, I should work and make my slides, my slides together. And then I thought, why? You know, I don't have any difficult data, or I don't have any complicated concepts to explain. So I said, why do I need slides? So I thought, oh, maybe I'm just afraid people would think I'm not serious. <laughs> or uh, I, would, I don't want people to look at me as I'm giving the presentation. And I thought, oh, those feelings maybe I don't have a strong basis <laughs> for a good presentation. So sorry, but anyway, uh, I won't be showing any <laughs> pictures or things, but I do have some sort of plan. I'm ju not just going to say anything. So I have some notes here. So I'm looking at my laptop, but you can look at me. Um, actually, also, the Wi-Fi doesn't work in my room. So last night, I, uh, instead of frantically looking online to refine my presentation, I was thinking about the main points while uh, watching curling. So it's a very <laughs> Canadian experience of uh, preparing the talk. And I, I recommend it. It's pretty good. It's pretty relaxing. <coughs> uh, so I want also to thank the organizers, Francis, Sarah, uh, Betsy. I was very happy to see the announcement that people care about this issue. I think it's very important. And for uh, the place where I work is very important for us. And I'm glad to see so much interest by people, including a lot of people that I don't know. And I see also a lot of ROI alumni or faculty from our institution who are interested, so I'm very happy. Uh, so my plan, I mean, I don't have a lot of, uh, I don't see this really as a research or sharing research results. Uh, this talk is rather sharing a learning experience I've had uh, from working in Nepal, especially trying to teach meditation. And so I'll basically tell a story for about 10 minutes, and then I'll explain what I learned from that story for about 10 minutes. And I'm hoping to have 10 more minutes so we can discuss. I'm really here to get your feedback also and your uh, uh, sort of comments on uh, the whole part, the whole uh, idea. Um, one theme uh, that came yesterday, I think that was very important, was the idea that you, we have to know our audience and know our students to be able to think about methods for teaching Buddhist studies. And so I think it's important to take about a minute and give you a sort of brief background about the Rangjing Inshe Institute, RYI, and because we have a very different group of students there, very different context, and that shapes a lot the way we work, and we are forced into certain ways of teaching just from the fact that we're in a different community. Okay, so the institute is located in Kathmandu, Nepal, in Bodhana. We are located inside the Tibetan monastery called Kanying Shilupling, uh, near Bodh Stupa. So I think those of you who've been to Nepal, you know the White Gompa is one of the very famous, important ones uh, created in the 60s by Tibetans coming in exile from Tibet. Uh, so we are physically located in the monastery. And also we uh, share a lot with the monastic community because a lot of our faculty are monastic teachers who are trained in the monastic college into the sort of Eastern Tibetan style, uh, Nyingma Shedda type of study that is basically word by word commentary on Indian classics, on major sort of topics of Indian philosophy. Uh, our student population is very different also from what I've seen in other universities. We have students from about 35 different countries. Um, there's no majority sort of nationality group. Okay, so the largest country in terms of representation is Nepal and it's about 30%. So there's no one majority country, but you could say that about 70, 65 to 70% are what we could call Western. But again, uh, as we said yesterday, those words Western, Eastern don't really make a lot of sense. Uh, a student from Brazil and a student from Germany have very different expectations and background. Okay. So, but anyway, there is a very diverse uh, population and we have a lot of local uh, Nepali or Himalayan students uh, that are part of the uh, student population. Uh, one of the, ma the major differences with other student populations is that people, uh, a lot of our students, uh, I would say the vast majority of our students, probably around 90%, consider themselves to be Buddhist. Uh, they are Buddhist believers, practitioners. Yeah? And uh, a lot of them come to study with us also with some sort of religious purpose in mind. They think that will help their Buddhist practice or their life as a Buddhist. So it was interesting to hear the uh, talk yesterday about uh, BYU. It's kind of the similar situation but flipped around in many ways. Uh, what you find in faculties uh, or Buddhist studies programs elsewhere. Also, uh, one way in which it's very different is that we teach basically only Buddhist studies. Yeah, 
there is no faculty member that teach Western religions or Judeo-Christian religions. So we are also flipped around in that side uh, with the sort of, uh, we too much focus on Buddhist traditions as opposed to other cultures. <coughs> Uh, one of the ideas that you hear a lot in Bauda in our program is this idea of being a scholar practitioner. That if you, uh, with our contacts with the, the Buddhist community in Nepal, uh, tell us that for a lot of members of that community, to study Buddhism in a sort of purely theoretical or academic way is seen as just strange. No? To be interested in learning Buddhist languages, studying Buddhist literature, doing Buddhist practices, but without really having the goal of transforming yourself in order to eventually achieve liberation is seen as some sort of funny thing that, uh, like, why would you want to do that, basically? Okay, so the Tibetans use the expression of being a dry scholar, and it's basically a bad term, like somebody who's interested in scholarship for the sake of their career, prestige, fame, wealth, and stuff like that. It's considered actually a dangerous thing to study Buddhist philosophy if you don't have the right motivation. Okay, and a lot of our students participate in that uh, in some sense. So it creates a very interesting situation with a lot of diversity, but also funny things. So for example, we have Nepali students who come from Buddhist culture, say from Sherpa or Taman communities, and they study about their religion because they feel they are not able to explain what it's about to other people from somebody from Canada, for example. And so there's a sort of interesting roles that are not very clearly identified about who's, uh, who has the sort of authority to explain what Buddhism is about. It creates a lot of interesting dynamics. Uh, we're also associated with Kathmandu University, so that's one of the private universities in Nepal, and so we grant BA, MA, and PhD degrees. And that has a whole other area, but uh, anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to go into that today, but I think it's important to mention it. Uh, but one of the issues that is kind of forced on you in Nepal is, uh, or in our context uh, at least, is, uh, and something you need to be aware of is something that I think in science is true in general, but people are not always aware of, like immediately, is what effect does our study and research of Buddhism have on the members of Buddhist communities? And how will people receive our work, our teaching, our research? And are we responsible somehow to care about how people feel about what we do in our work as academics? Okay, and I think that's the general theme, uh, the, the sort of relation with living Buddhist communities. Yeah, Buddhist, Buddhism is not a dead religion. There are still Buddhists around, and we have to be aware of what our work has, you know, in terms of effect on those people. And in Nepal, you can't just sort of say that theoretically is forced on you. And so the story I'll tell today is basically about that. Okay, so the, uh, the sort of so short story I'm going to tell is about um, trying to teach uh, Buddhist meditation in Nepal. Okay, so we have a program, our students uh, study mostly research languages, Sanskrit, Tibetan, Nepali. They also study a lot of Buddhist philosophy and they have religious studies type uh, courses say in their four-year BA program, that's what they study. And one of the courses is called Buddhist Meditation Practices. Uh, it used to be Buddhist Meditation Practices and Ritual. Now we've separated it into two different courses. Okay, And that's the course that I've taught, uh, I think, if I remember the first year I came to Nepal in 2011. And then I've taught it two more times since then. And um, okay, so we go over the sort of uh, scriptural sources, canonical sources on meditation. We look at sort of oral traditions, the sort of historical perspective. Anyway, it's basically a sort of survey of what kinds of practices you find in Buddhist tradition uh, with a historical and textual focus, more or less. But what came up once was that uh, we started discussing the curriculum and somebody said, well, how come in a college in the United States or in Canada, you can get credit for just practicing meditation? Then you just go to the meditation workshop or yoga or relaxation, whatever, and you write some sort of reflection paper or meditation journal and you get credit and we are in a Buddhist institution where most of the people are Buddhist anyway, so they won't be shocked by having to sit down or do that kind of exercise. But somehow it, we can't make it fit into the program, so something must be wrong. So, w and especially with this idea of scholar practitioner, we felt that, oh, we should give students an opportunity to try those things out. So we said, okay, as part of the course, we'll have, uh, instead of just three hours or regular classwork, we'll have two hours and two hours of meditation practicum or meditation workshop where students go, they get time to sit, they try to correlate it with what they learn in class, and then they'll get to experience it. Okay. The, and now, uh, at that point, things got uh, quite interested. So the first question was, okay, who's going to teach or lead that class? Yeah. And uh, then we realized, oh, okay, we are part of the Tibetan monastery. That should be taught by one of the monastic teachers. Okay, so we have Lopen Kempo, people who have graduated from the monastic Shera. 
we ask some of them, okay, can you give an extra hour of meditation once a week or twice a week and the students will try it. And it was interesting, the, they said, well, we, we're scholars, yeah? we don't really practice meditation <laughs> or we're not really trained. <laughs> We're not really, uh, we don't feel confident teaching that, so you should ask the lamas. You know, people have completed the three-year retreat, and they have much more experience with the techniques and how people work, and so they'll teach it, it's much better. So we went to the lamas, or, and they said, well, no, this is the shedda, yeah? it's a monastic culture, so you should ask the kempos to teach that. Uh, we don't feel comfortable teaching like this. So we said, oh, okay, well, we have a Western lama who's completed a retreat, and it would be very good uh, sort of for interaction, and he might understand a little bit better what we're trying to do. And then they said, well, you know, to have Westerners teach <laughs> in a sort of practice setting is a bit tricky, so maybe better not. So then we say, okay, so who then is going to do it? And most of the, I think two out of the three times it ended up being one of the Lopans who has uh, experience, a little bit more experience in meditation. A lot of the teachers actually, when they complete the curriculum, they go into longer retreat. So some of them are confident or some of them are personally interested. And some of them are not that interested in a personal meditation practice, for example. But some of them are, and they said, okay, we'll do it. Okay. So the who question was interesting. The second one was the format. Okay, what's going to happen in that meditation class? And if you put a Lopan or a Kempo, usually they expect they're going to communicate something orally, and usually using a text as a basis for oral commentary. So the idea that they had to sit for an hour and not basically talk for five minutes and then just practice meditation together, they weren't comfortable with. They somehow felt that that's a waste of time, uh, if you're going to practice, so they were teaching things like shamatha, you know, basic stabilization, meditation, mindfulness, things like that. And they felt, uh, you do that alone in your room, you're on your bed, and there's no <laughs> sort of point to come to class for that. And I didn't study nine years in the shara to just sit with you guys. <laughs> okay? uh, there seems to be something like that going on. And especially in the Tibetan tradition, there is uh, some instance of uh, kind of practicing meditation together. So basically sitting in front of the room and people look at you. But that is a very sort of reserved for very prestigious lamas and it would be seen as a very kind of esoteric initiation. And so for a regular teacher to sit like that and say, blend your mind with mine, something like that, it would be very inappropriate actually. <laughs> so, so what happened most of the time is the teachers ended up uh, teaching for about talking 45 minutes, the posture and the basic techniques and things like that, and then practicing for 15 minutes. So in the student evaluations we got, well, we didn't actually practice it. So we said, oh, what's wrong? How come it's so difficult? Uh, so there was also the question of individual, individual versus group practice. Uh, there's a lot of group practice in the monastery, in Kanyin Monastery. It's usually rituals. It has the whole music and all of that. And the meditation part is sometimes just really a few seconds or uh, while you have tea. Uh, so the, the actual signed meditation is not a big part of the group practice and it's considered something you do at, at home. Okay, um, and so that was one issue also that the, the teachers who ended up doing it were not so uh, comfortable with the format. Uh, finally, the one criticism we got or one sort of uh, comment from the students was that it was very difficult to connect the meditation practice with the content of the course. Uh, it was always difficult to establish that connection between, for example, what I would uh, bring up in the lectures and in the discussions in class and what students were doing in the practice. Okay. So that's basically the story. So we uh, did it and we keep trying, but every time there seemed to be something that doesn't work or that our expectations and the students' expectations are not met somehow. And it's all, it seems to make people uncomfortable in a sense in the community. So at first I thought, you know, you live in Nepal for a while, you work at the monastery, it's not always easy. And after a while you think, oh, those guys are so difficult. <laughs> yeah, they, why don't, can't they just do something simple like that. And then I thought, wait a minute, th is that it really? Or is there something sort of more important going on here? Is there something a little bit uh, more interesting to learn about that experience? And thinking about it, I came to the conclusion that yes, th that actually was a good learning experience from us, you know, for us, from working in that context and that the lessons are important and they tell us something about how we think about we're going to teach a course about Buddhist meditation practices or about Buddhist rituals. Okay, so uh, here are uh, the lessons. Uh, first, the first thing I uh, thought about is why do we think that experiencing Buddhism means experiencing meditation? Yeah. I, think it's, I think all of you, and especially in our community in Nepal, people are completely aware of the fact that reducing Buddhism to meditation practices is a very modern trope, it's a very Western invention. And that if you look in the Buddhist community in Nepal, for example, that's not what people think at all. 
because people are all aware of that. But I think as Natasha you said yesterday, sometimes we have those things that we know are not true, but we somehow keep bringing them into, into the classroom. And that was the case of saying, we all sort of spend our lives lecturing about how these are, you have to be aware, these are modern inventions, these are influenced by Western Buddhism, and it's very, uh, we have to be very careful about projecting that onto the tradition. But then when we came to write the syllabus, we did exactly that. <laughs> so we said, oh, what the, why, you <laughs> know, what's, what's happening? And um, especially uh, tricky uh, with that, I, uh, in that uh, sort of project was that often when we say, okay, we're gonna practice meditation, we immediately thought about a, either a secularized or secular friendly type of meditation, mm -hmm. yeah, like shamatha, mindfulness. Actually, in that course, I was trying to, uh, part of the course, I put a lot of emphasis on uh, mind training, lojong, because uh, that has much more uh, rich content for people to understand cultivation practices in the Tibetan context. But somehow we thought, oh, okay, we don't want to force the students in, into some kind of practice they're not comfortable with, so we'll teach something that basically anybody can do that's harmless, even though maybe you're not a Buddhist. Because we do have also minorities who are not Buddhist. Yeah? Uh, for example, we, uh, often had uh, missionaries, Christian missionaries, mm -hmm. a little bit like you were describing yesterday, who want to learn about Buddhism, to do a better job as a missionary, whatever that means. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it can mean many things. Yeah? There are different types of uh, missionary activities. <coughs> okay, so we thought, why, uh, first of all, we think about mindfulness or meditation, and why do we go for a secularized practice? So we had ideas that we were reproducing things that have been defined by constraints that are true here in North America, for example. Uh, for example, as you said, in Quebec, it's really tricky to bring those kinds of things. I saw also in California, they were just trying to teach yoga in the schools, and there was a big uh, sort of protesting. Yeah? Okay. And so we were somehow bringing that in Nepal, uh, which didn't make sense because our students didn't really care uh, about doing Buddhist practice. They probably had their own practice, most of them. And second, also, there's, uh, there was an idea that uh, when you want to give a scientific justification for using those practices in the classroom, Often you use language of ethnographic, you know, participant observation. It's not enough to just read about that. You have to kind of live it, experience it. And uh, it doesn't mean you're trying to convert people to Buddhism. They're just trying to sort of understand the people they're trying to communicate, uh, live with. Um, so if that's the case, why is it so much more problematic to do a participate in a ritual, for example, uh, uh, compared to meditation? Okay. Or is it, it's almost like you use that rationale to justify doing those practices, but you don't really take it seriously or you don't really believe in it. That, okay, I, I want to participate, but not in something you know that's going to go against my rule. So there's a sort of halfway ethnographic uh, attitude that leads to some unclarity there. So I thought, okay, what other ways could we use then if meditation is not the solution, you have to have the Buddhist experience? What kind of other sort of immersive practice could we have? And then I, I thought, well, it's very simple. Uh, for example, I uh, remember it in uh, UCAM in Montreal, there's somebody called Elijah Ari. He used to ask his students to take five precepts for a month yeah, and try to follow that. that. You'll get some Buddhist experience by doing that also. Okay, it doesn't have to be meditation. In Nepal, you could participate in a ritual. You could go and circumambulate Bauda Stupa every morning for a month. And you'll learn a lot and you'll be immersed in culture. It doesn't have to be only meditation. So I thought, why don't we think about those kinds of practices instead? And I realized, oh, okay, we still have this assumption that meditation is the real thing uh, to experience Buddhism. <coughs> so that was the first point. Yeah? Uh, second, I thought uh, sort of our interaction with the monastic faculty uh, was itself interesting learning experience in that case. I realized that uh, maybe part of the reasons why it was so difficult to organize the class was that it, there was nothing built in the system to explain who is responsible for that kind of teaching. So there is no kind of teacher of secularized meditation in a Tibetan monastery. So nobody is responsible for that. So they weren't just being unhelpful or difficult or tricky. They just, they understood what we wanted to do, but they didn't understand why and why that would be desirable. And also who would be in a good position to teach that. So it's almost like you ask a sort of Nepali, most of them are Nepali scholars who are trained in the monastery to say, just become a secularized meditation teacher for a while, and then you'll help our students understand uh, what Dharma is really about. And they, it, it just didn't work. Yeah? And so I thought either it's, it's just kind of usual gompa politics or something like that, or either there's something deeper going on here. And I think that's really what was happening. There was something deeper. 
the idea of separating the meditation practice from other aspects of Buddhism for uh, those teachers, whether they're Lopans or Kempos or other Lamas, uh, just didn't make sense. They said, you want to experience Buddhism, but the very elements that make that cultivation practice Buddhist, you're trying to remove. Yeah? So for example, even if they teach Shamatha, they would always start with uh, reciting verses for refuge, motivation, you know, Bodhicitta, it's a Mahayana mm -hmm. context. And then you do Shamatha. You don't do just Shamatha like that. They would say, well, that's nice, yeah, but it's not Buddhist. Okay, so if you want to experience Buddhism, but you remove the Buddhist part, you say, what, uh, what kind of experience is that? Okay, so it was uh, very helpful to be able to see that those assumptions were still at work, and they were not just, oh, okay, it's funny, you know, uh, modernist, Buddhist kind of came up with this. It was a deep clash into the expectations of our monastic faculty and uh, that we had. And not that we had, you know, consciously, but we were sort of just sort of having them, okay? But the learning uh, experience was, okay, these guys, they mean it when they say, you know, Shamatha is not Buddhist, for example. And it's true historically as well, yeah? The Buddhists are not the only ones who have developed those co concentration practices. So I say, oh, they really mean that. <laughs> They're like, it's serious. And I say, oh, wow, okay, something interesting, okay? And especially uh, one of the categories that we were, it seems to be we were using in there was to uh, contrast academic and spiritual, yeah, as if those are mutually exclusive. And if you are academic, you cannot be involved in some sort of cultivation practice, for example. And they didn't seem to have that at all. They thought, yeah, your academic study is spiritual practice. And that's something we hear all the time. You know, meditation is not just stabilizing <coughs> or quiet. It's also when you study, when you memorize, when you uh, reflect on the meaning of things, that's spiritual practice as well. Okay, so we said, oh, okay, that's interesting learning experience. Okay, and especially uh, there's a view in secularized Buddhism that uh, the study of views or metaphysics is somehow not Buddhist and not related to Buddhist practice. Uh, in this case, it was very clear that no, the study of views is what fuels your meditation, is what inspires your cultivation practices. And so if you come and say, study views here and then stop that completely and do meditation separately, these uh, guys were just puzzled completely. And they said, no, no, that's, those things go together. Yeah? Okay? And so the fact that maybe you're not doing that much meditation <coughs> doesn't mean you're not a good Buddhist or whatever. You, you, because there, is, there are those stereotypes you know, that Buddhist monks don't meditate and this is all a Western creation. Actually, they do, some of them when they are inspired to do so. And often it's by their study, okay? But to put them in separate categories like that was uh, problematic in some sense, okay? So uh, I learned something, I mean, those are ideas you already have in mind, but you learn that, oh, okay, it's actually real and people take it seriously. And finally, uh, just a short one is, and I, maybe I'll sound like I'm bragging a little bit about how great it is to be in Nepal. <laughs> it's nice sometimes to focus on the positive <laughs> aspects, but uh, there's a difference in that kind of experience happening in a Buddhist community. And for example, coming to a conference and somebody will tell you, oh, you're separating meditation and academic practices. You should be careful about your assumptions. In this case, we were trying to do something pedagogically and it just didn't work because we were interacting directly with the people. And so it did, there was kind of a direct reality check that this doesn't work, guys. You can't do this. Even if you try hard, you're not gonna be able to convince people. And so I thought, oh, okay, I, if I tried to do that, for example, in Canada, I might have been able to do it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And nobody would have said anything. But now I realized, oh, okay, I'm sort of talking about members of that community, or I'm sort of forcing them into some ways of teaching that they're not comfortable with. And the result is that it doesn't work and we have to change the way. So, so that, that means uh, I thought, oh, it would be useful if we can have a little bit more interaction with Buddhist communities interact you know, on, about our pedagogical methods, about our projects and things like that, and it might, might make them um, more respectful of their sort of feelings in a sense, but also uh, help us learn more about the topic we're trying to learn. Okay, so I think I, so that's it. I think I can stop here. I've lost track of when I'm supposed to stop, but I think I have a few minutes left. Yeah, you got okay. three minutes. Oh, okay, that's good. Okay, thanks. Okay.